Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL animation tutorial and this week we're going to be having a close look at the implementation of the animated model structure and the animated model rendering code. So just a quick reminder of what these parts of the system do. So an animated model is made up of two things, the skin and the skeleton. And the skeleton is made up of a load of joints which are arranged in a hierarchy. Each joint has a transform which determines the current position and rotation of the joint and by setting the transforms of the joints in the skeleton, we can set the current pose of the animated model. The skin is basically just mesh data in a VAO, which contains all of the normal stuff, as well as some extra information about which joints affect each vertex. The animated model renderer can then render an animated model to the screen in the current pose by calculating the position of each vertex based on the joint transforms and the skinning information in the VAO. So we're now going to have a look at how all of that is implemented in the code. And if you haven't already, you can download the full code for this example from the description of this video. So let's start off in the joint class first, which of course represents one of the joints in an animated model skeleton. First off, you can see that each joint has an index, which is like the ID of the joint. And if you remember from last week, the joint transforms get loaded up to the shader in a uniform array and this index indicates which position in the array this joint transform will be stored. Each joint also has a string name, and this is just the name that the joint is given in the collard file. Each joint also has a list of children, because as you know, the joints are stored in a hierarchy, and so each joint can potentially have multiple children joints. Each joint except for the root joint also has one parent joint, but we never actually need to know about a joint's parent in this example, so that isn't stored here. Then we have that all important joint matrix, which is what needs to be set in order to position the joint in the current pose. And just to remind you, this animated transform is the transform needed to move the joint from its original position in the model, that's the position that it's at when no animation at all is applied, to the position in the current pose. And the transform is in model space, so that basically means in the model's coordinate system. And of course, it's this matrix transform that gets loaded up to the shader in the uniform array, and it will be stored at index position in that array. And then in the vertex shader, it can be applied to a vertex position to transform the vertex from its original model space position to the model space position it should be at in the current pose. Finally, we have these two other matrices here, which are just used in the calculation of the joint transforms in the animator. So we'll be having a much more in-depth look at them in the next tutorial. But just very quickly, the local bind transform is the original transform of the joint in relation to its parent joint. And anywhere in the code where you see the word bind, it's referring to the original pose of the model with no animation applied. And anywhere where you see local space or bone space as it's sometimes called, it means in relation to the parent joint as opposed to in model space, which is in relation to the model's origin. This transform is actually only used to calculate this transform here, which is the bind transform of the joint, so that's the original position and rotation of the joint, but in model space this time, and it's also inverted, so instead of this, it is this. And this transformation is used in the calculation of the joint matrices in the animator class, as you will see in the next video. So the constructor here, all very simple, just takes in the joint index, the name, and the transformation of the joint in the original bind pose in relation to the parent joint. There's then just a method to add a child to the joint, which is only used during setup for the creation of the joint hierarchy. And there's also a getter and setter for the joint transform. And of course, as I've mentioned before, setting this joint transform is what determines the current position and rotation of the joint. Finally, we've got a getter for the inverse bind transform, which again is the model space original transform of the joint, but inverted. And this, as I've said, is used in the animator for calculating the joint matrix for this joint. And finally, we have a method here, which is used only during setup, and it's actually to calculate this inverse bind transform. To calculate the inverse bind transform for this joint, we first have to calculate the non-inverted bind transform in model space, which we can then invert. And to calculate the bind transform for this joint, we multiply together the model space bind transform of the parent joint and the local space bind transform of this joint. So for example, if we're trying to calculate it for this joint here, we have the local space bind transform because we took that in in the constructor, if you remember. And we also have the model space bind transform of the parent joint 
because that's taken in as an argument for this method. And we multiply them together to get the model space bind transform for this joint. So that's the original transform of the joint in relation to the model's origin. And we then just have to invert that, and that will give us the inverse bind transform for this joint. You'll notice that this method is then called recursively to calculate the inverse bind transform for all of this joint's children as well, and that needs to take in the parent model space bind transform, which of course was just calculated here. So outside of this class, this method just needs to be called once during setup on the root joint, and the method will then be recursively called for all of the joints in the skeleton until they've all calculated their inverse bind transform. And as I said, we'll be looking at what the inverse bind transform is used for in the next tutorial. So let's now move on to the animated model class, and this class is really pretty simple. Obviously, this represents an animated model in the game, and as you know, it's made up of two things. The skin, which is just the mesh data in the VAO and also a texture, and the skeleton, which is the hierarchy of joints. And seeing as the joints are in a hierarchy, we only need to reference the root joint here. So that's the joint at the top of the hierarchy that has no parent. We also need to have a count of the total number of joints in the skeleton, just so that when we create the array of joint transforms to load up to the shader, we know how big to make it. Each animated model also needs to have its own animator, and the animator of course has the job of keeping track of the current animation and calculating and setting the joint transforms accordingly. So the constructor here, very simple again, just takes in the mesh, the texture and the skeleton information, and the joint hierarchy will have already been set up at this stage. And it then just sets all of them, creates a new animator, and it then calls that method that we were just looking at for the root joint to calculate the inverse bind transform for the root joint, and therefore for all the other joints in the skeleton as well. And you'll remember that this has to take in the bind transform of the parent joint, but seeing as the root joint has no parent, it just takes in an identity matrix. Then we've just got some getter methods, a delete method to delete the VAO and texture object when the game is closed, and then a couple of methods here to do with the animator, one to set the current animation, and then one update method to update the animator, which needs to be called every frame. Finally, we have one more public method which gets the array of joint transforms for this model's skeleton that needs to be loaded up to the shader, and this simply creates an array of matrices, and of course the size of this array is joint count, because there's one joint transform for each joint in the skeleton, and then this recursive method here is used to add the transform for each joint into the array. So you can see that for each joint, the joint transform is got and added into the array at that joint's index, and then the same thing happens for all of that joint's children, and then all of their children, and then their children, and so on. So all the joint transforms get added into that array, and that array is then returned. So that was the animated model class, but before we move on, let's just have a quick look at the mesh VAO in a bit more detail, specifically at what data exactly is stored in it. So the VAO is created here, and we'll be having a look at the CLAD loaders in another tutorial, but for this week I just want to cover what data about the mesh is actually stored in the VAO for an animated model. So in attributes 1 to 3 it's all the usual stuff that you should be very familiar with by now, and there is also an index buffer as usual. However, there are two extra per vertex attributes that we use for an animated model, and this is the skinning information for each vertex in the model, which is information about which joints affect which vertices, and by how much. Firstly, each vertex has an integer vec3, which can hold the ID or the index of up to three joints that affect that vertex. So if a vertex is affected by two joints, for example, then it would store the indexes of those two joints in the first two components of the vec3. Each vertex also has a float vec3, which contains the corresponding weights for each of the joints that affect that vertex. So if there are two joints affecting the vertex, then there will be two weights. The weights indicate how much each joint affects the vertex's position, and all of the weights for a vertex must add up to a total of 1. So if both of the joints affect the vertex equally, then the weights would both be 0.5, but if one joint were to affect the vertex more than the other, then the weights might be something like 0.7 and 0.3, or 0.8 and 0.2, and so on. 
The actual OpenGL functions behind the setting up of the VAO here should all be stuff that you're very familiar with by now. I'm sure you all know how to create and bind a VAO and set up an index buffer and store data in the attributes of a VAO, but there is one tiny detail that I haven't covered before in any of my tutorials, and that is storing integer data as a vertex attribute, which is of course what we need to do for the joint IDs because they are ints and not floats. The only difference here is that we have to use GL vertex attrib I pointer instead of GL vertex attrib pointer like we usually do, and of course we have to use GL int here instead of GL float. So that is all the code for representing an animated model, so let's now move on and have a look at the renderer code, and the renderer's job is of course to render the animated model in the current pose, which is determined by the joint transforms. The Java code part of the renderer is all pretty basic stuff, and there shouldn't really be anything in here that you haven't already seen a hundred times before. The animated model shader class is just in charge of setting up the shader program and getting all of the uniform locations, binding the attributes, and all of that usual stuff that we've been doing since episode 5, and you'll notice that I've structured this in a slightly different way from how we've done it in previous tutorials, but there's absolutely nothing new here in terms of OpenGL code, it's all just the same old stuff, but just rearranged slightly to make it easier to add new uniform variables. The renderer class is also just all very basic stuff in terms of OpenGL concepts, and I'm sure there's nothing here that will confuse you at all. And the only real point of interest here is that before we render the animated model, we get the array of joint transforms by using that method that we looked at earlier, and we then load them up to a uniform array in the shader. So all the magic actually happens in the vertex shader, so let's now have a look through that. Firstly, up at the top we've got a couple of constants, so there's the max joints, which is the maximum number of joints that any model can have, so you can change that number accordingly depending on what kind of models you're going to be using, and this is just used to set the size of the joint transforms array. There's also a constant for the maximum number of joints that can affect a single vertex, and as I mentioned earlier, that is 3 in our case. You could potentially increase this to 4 if you think it's necessary, and then you'd also just need to use vec4s for the skinning info. Then here we've got all the in variables, all the vertex attributes coming from the data in the VAO, which as we've already talked about is all the usual stuff, plus the two extra attributes here, which is the skinning data, and just note how the joint indices are an i vec3 instead of just a vec3, because it's a vec3 of integers, not floats. We've then got some usual out variables to pass the texture chords and the normal vector to the fragment shader, and then here we've got the uniform variables, firstly the array of joint transforms which will contain the current transform for all of the joints in the model that's currently being rendered, and lastly we've got the projection view matrix, which is the projection matrix already pre-multiplied with the view matrix. So in the actual main function code here, if we just ignore the first bit for a minute and look at these bottom three lines, you can see that we've got some extremely normal looking vertex shader code here. We're just calculating the GL position by multiplying the projection matrix with the view matrix, and if you had a model matrix you'd multiply that in here, multiplied by the vertex position, and we're then just passing the normal vector and the texture coordinates to the fragment shader. The only difference is that this vertex position here is first being deformed using the joint transforms and the skinning information to move it from its original position in the mesh to the position it should be in the current pose. So the important lines are of course these ones here, and firstly you can see that there's a for loop which is looping once for every joint that could affect this vertex, and as you know that's a maximum of three joints, so this will loop three times. For each joint that affects this vertex we first get the index of the joint from the joint indices, and we then use that index to get the current transform for that joint from the array of joint transforms. We can then use that transform and apply it to the original vertex position, which will transform the vertex from its original position in the mesh to the desired position in the pose, but only as if it were affected by that one single joint. So that happens for each joint that affects the vertex, giving us three different end positions, and we then basically take a weighted average of those three final positions by multiplying them by the associated joint weight, and adding them to this total local position. And after looping through all of the joints that affect the vertex, the total local position will contain the final model space position of the vertex in the current pose. We also just have to do the exact same thing for the normal vector here, because obviously as the vertices in the model are being deformed, the normal vector is also going to change as well, 
And then, as I've said already, we just calculate the GL position like always, pass the normal and the text chords to the fragment shader, and then in the fragment shader we just sample the texture, calculate the diffuse lighting, and set the output colour. So that was all of the code involved with representing an animated model and being able to render it to the screen in a given pose. Next time we're going to be having a look at the animation data structure and the animator class, and then there'll be another tutorial after that where I'll cover the loaders in more detail. For this week though, that is it. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you all next time.